Okay, so let's get started with the next session. First, we are going to talk a little bit about normalization. So I'm Heli, and I'm currently splitting my time between the University of Helsinki, where I work as a postdoc at the research program of translational immunology, and a small academic startup called Cellex, where I do R&D on single cell transcriptomics. So, <clears throat> in normalization, we aim to remove uh, um, non-biological variation, or also, you can also remove a variation that is biolog biological, but not interesting from your point of view. And uh, also the aim is to make the count distributions comparable between different cells. In single cell sequencing, usually only cell between cells normalization is usually done. With three prime tag data, you don't need to do a gene length normalization, but if you have full length data, like from SmartSeq2, then also the gene length must be taken into account. And so the aim of the normalization is to remove these uh, biases typical to the single cell data. So after normalization, the gene expression should not be clearly correlated with the sequencing depth of the cell. And also the uh, <coughs> variance should mainly reflect the biological variation uh, instead of technical variation across the cell across the cells. So like we already discussed in the QC, the uh, single cell RNA sequencing data is different from bulk RNA seq. One major reason is that it's noisy. So you have a low mRNA com content in a single cell. You have these differences in mRNA capture sequencing depth and so on, random variation. <clears throat> and also you have uh, different cell types within the same sample. So uh, this bulk RNA-seq normalization methods don't necessarily work well by themselves. There's a picture from the <clears throat> authors of the s scan package. So where they are just showing that uh, Throwing a few uh, methods often used for bulk RNA seq, like RBM and DE seq, which are not really working that well for this, this data set. But that also may depend on, on what kind of data you have. So, in order to uh, separate the biological and technical variants, you have to make some kind of an estimate of how what kind of technical variants you have in the data. And sometimes this has been done with uh, spiking RNAs, but with droplet-based single cell methodologies, uh, spikings are usually not used because then you would end up sequencing a lot of uh, empty barcodes with nothing but spikes. And the cost is not really worth, worth it. So spikings are, mainly used in blade-based methods. And so the technical variance needs to be estimated from the whole data. And here it is assumed that most of the genes don't change in expression. So the bulk of gene expression variability is just due to technical reasons. So, uh, <clears throat> There are a lot of different normalization methods. The, the most common ones are, are based on size factors one way or the other. But uh, lately there have also been introduced some new models of uh, probabilistic normalization. I'm not going to talk about them, but one of those uh, types is this uh, zero inflated negative binomial models, which are, could be uh, up and coming in the future, maybe. 
But uh, <clears throat> so um, uh, counts per million transcripts per million methods are themselves not really sufficient, but they can be combi combined by with other procedures, as we will see, to make them better suited for single cell RNA sequencing data. And uh, then if you do full length transcriptome with a plate based method, you also can or must use these gene length normalizing methods. And uh, some, some bulk RNA normalization methods, for instance, DSeq are often used. And for some data sets, they might work also. But here, the problem sometimes becomes that because there are so many dropouts in the data, the size factors may become zero. So then the normalization with these methods is impossible. One <clears throat> group of uh, size factor based normalization methods are uh, these global, global scaling methods. And these are very commonly used here. It's assumed that RNA levels are not varying very much between cells, which, well, depends on the data how reasonable that assumption is. So this is usually some kind of modified CPM normalization, which is used at least in cell rats and also in this Cell Ranger 10, uh, 10x software, which is basically a kind of CPM like normalization followed, followed by a log transformation. So this also seems to work quite well for many, many data sets. And one quite, re quite recently uh, published method is this uh, deconvolution or pooling that was uh, published by Aaron Lund a couple of years ago. So in this method, you, um, you pull several cells together to make a kind of a pseudo cell. And then, uh, uh, so you sum up all the counts to get rid of this zero or dropout problem and normalize that to a reference, which is uh, in this case, a um, reference pseudo cell made by pooling all the cells together. And you, you repeat and continue with this many times until every individual cell is part of several different pools. And from those pools, you can then deconvolute the cells, cell specific size factors with linear algebra. And this method is implemented in the SCRAN uh, package, which we will use later in the um, exercise session. Um, one more thing that I want to mention is this uh, um, Bayesian model based methods. I'm not sure if they should be called size factor or probabilistic methods, but one of them is this basics. This at least originally has required spike ins, but I think it's now being developed so that it can be used for, for data when you don't have spike ins. Um, but, um, so that was all that I have on normalization. So there are no questions. I will talk a little bit about, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, there are no uh, strict rules about when you, when you should use which method. You basically just need to uh, try it out and see if it works for your data. So I would probably start with something a bit more simple, like like this global global scaling methods. And if that doesn't seem to remove the um, um, bias, 
of the dependency of the um, expression on the sequencing depth, then continue and use some other methods like this deconvolution algorithm. But basically, you just have to try it out and see how it works. <clears throat> okay, so then usually next step before doing principal component analysis or, or clustering is uh, selecting interesting genes. So usually you want to exclude genes that are invariably expressed because they are not going to give you any interesting information anyway. And by doing this, you can improve the signal to noise ratio and also make the statistics and computations a little bit easier. One, <clears throat> this can also be done with many, many different methods. One popular group of uh, methods is selecting HVGs, highly variable genes. And, but then you can also look at gene correlations and one quite obvious, perhaps obvious way is to do the principal component analysis and then just choose the top genes from the PCs. But um, <clears throat> for the highly variable genes, you're looking for genes which are standing out from the null model that is describing the technical noise in your data. And one common way of doing this is to fit some kind of mean variance trend to your data and then choose the genes that are, uh, have higher variance than the expected variance from the trend. And then another uh, way of doing this is looking at the coefficient of variation. And yet another method is to look at the dropout rate of the genes. So if you have a, have a high, high number of zeros in your data for some gene, that means that it's probably a cell type specifically expressed gene. So therefore it is interesting. And uh, then, well, I just mentioned the gene, gene correlation. So you can also use this, this for selecting interesting genes. So the idea is that if you have uh, different cell types in your data, then there will be groups of genes that are correlated in their expression. And that, that correlation tells you that they are probably true uh, two variable genes instead of being just a randomly up or down. This method assumes that the technical noise is independent for each cell, but that is obviously not always true. If you have batch effects, then, then this assumption doesn't hold. So that was a very brief run through of the different methods. There are, there are really so many different ways of, of doing this. That, uh, and here I only talked about unsupervised methods of choosing variable genes, but of course you might also want to take some list of uh, genes that you know that are important in your biological model. For instance, if you've already done one experiment which is similar and got a list of variable genes, then you might want to use the same list to analyze a new set of data. And you just need to be sure that, that your data doesn't contain some other variability which you're not aware of. And I think I will stop here and give over the Bishwa, who is then going to talk about a bit more about the uh, confounding variables. Are there any questions? <clears throat> 